Warning, the following podcast contains adult language in its most juvenile form. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by HelloFresh and by the new meal delivery service for people who want stale shit, Hell No Fresh. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Good news, everyone. It's me, Professor Farnsworth. I'm here to tell you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. And if you want to see a cosplay of my good pal Bender, then go to Rich Roll at Instagram to see it. Thanks. It's January 18th. And it's National Peking Duck Day. Oh, you like what you see, you dirty little duck? Not that kind of Peking. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Chelsea, Handlers, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the duck jerking off through my window will make no sense anymore. (laughs) People in North Carolina and Montana scour the woods after Pornhub shuts them down. And we'll pick another book to hate read. But first, the diatribe. I had that moment again where a Christian saw my office. That was always fun. I had relatives over. One of them wanted to see my studio. Right, he knew what I did for a living. He wanted to see where the magic happened. And that's awkward because he's very much a believer and a vocal one. And my studio, which is also my office, is very much atheist. It's decorated with shit that listeners gave me, right, over the years. So there's a license plate that says atheist. There's atheist t-shirts. There's a painting of sword mouth Jesus. It's a lot for Christians to take in. So he looks around. He does the facial expression equivalent of the sign of the cross. And, and then his eyes land on my bookshelf, specifically the shelf with the Bible and all the religious reference materials. And his eye lingers there for a moment, and I know that part of it is because he's jealous that my Bible is bigger than me, but finally he formulates the question. And it's the same question they always ask, so much so that it was rude for me to force him to formulate it rather than just handing it to him on a fucking card or something. He says, if you're not a Christian, why are you so interested in Christianity? And sometimes this question is accusatory, right? They, 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 they're they trying to imply that I secretly believe in their God and I've got all this stuff because I'm inextricably drawn towards their truth. But I didn't get that impression in this instance. He was just genuinely curious, and that makes it a hard question to answer. Not because the answer is hard to say, mind you, but because it's hard to hear. Because his question is exactly backwards. What makes religion interesting is precisely the fact that it isn't true. Why the fuck would you be interested in it if it was true? Right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm interested in the truth of the world as much as anybody else. But if Christianity were true, then the ultimate answers are known. And there's not much more to see. The, the answer to the fundamental question is magic. And any look into the religion itself is just satisfying a curiosity about you know, fucking interior decorating choices their God made when he created the universe. But that's just what it does to regular questions. The questions about religion itself fare even worse if you're a believer. Questions like, who is God? What is God like? And why is God like that? Are all cheapened to sheer knickknackery if he's a real dude. They're not much more interesting or profound than questions like, who is Dave? And why is Dave the way he is? Of course, religion isn't real, so questions about God's nature are imbued with all kinds of really cool meaning, right? Who a culture's God is and what that God is like tells you a lot about their cultural values. Learning how their God got like he is tells you a lot about their shared history. Looking at how they interact with that God tells you about their cosmology. Studying the way they relate to their deity tells you about their sociology. That's all really interesting shit. And it, it, it's gone as soon as you believe in one of the gods, right? You have to divide your world then into people who are religiously correct and incorrect. And at best, you can only ask your really interesting questions about people outside your group. I mean, sure, you can ask about your own God, and no doubt you will. 
You can ask why your God wants this type of calf as a sacrifice and not that one. You can ask why he's got a thing against shellfish. You can ask why he chooses the symbols that he chooses. But until you can step outside the religion and view those questions from an objective historical perspective, you can't answer them correctly. Because if God's real, the reason he wants this or that sacrifice can't be dependent on the availability or value of certain draft animals in the 5th century BCE Levant or whatever. It has to be because God likes that particular flavor. I mean, the most interesting aspect of religion, if you ask me, is comparative. But if you're standing inside one of the face, the only meaningful comparisons are right versus wrong. You can't even compare your own religion to itself a hundred or a thousand years ago because to do so would be to admit that it isn't the universal, unchanging, absolute truth that it purports to be. So why am I, a non-Christian, interested in Christianity? Because I'm honest enough to see what the interesting bits are. Because I'm actually allowed to ask why it is the way that it is and how it got there and consider multiple perspectives along the way to an answer. And when I find an interesting question, I'm allowed to pursue it no matter where the answer leads. And let me tell you, the coolest places it tends to go are the ones that the Christians are least allowed to follow. So, yeah, as strange as it is to say, it looks like we can fairly add the benefits of religion to the huge list of shit that religion robs you of. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Abbott and Costello to my mummy, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to wrap up this intro? First, I'm on first. Oh, I hate being the who guy. <laughs> All right. Well, clearly I've got to ask Heath who he is or something. So while I do that, <laughs> we'll pause for a word from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. Hello, sir. Welcome to Danny's Ding Dang Diner. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, I'm on a special diet, and I was wondering what your options are for me. Ugh, special diet? What am I, HelloFresh? What's HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. And what do you have here? Well, I mean, we got a 76-page menu, but it doesn't have anything for you in it. But, but you're saying that HelloFresh does? They sure do. They have over 45 dinner options to choose from weekly and even more market add-on items that suit any lifestyle. They got vegan, veggie, calorie smart meals, and so much more. Wow. So I can save money by eating at home and keep my diet? All while skipping the hassle of grocery shopping. I don't know. Have you actually tried it? I have. I'm here too. I was a HelloFresh customer even before they became a sponsor. I love how the meals unpack in the fridge in seconds, and I love that I can work deliveries around my busy schedule. All right, well, then I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Go to HelloFresh.com slash scathingfree and use code scathingfree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash scathingfree with code scathingfree. All right, thanks. So since I'm here, is, is the halibut fresh? Uh, you remember the creation of the sun? No. Well, the halibut does. Got it. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, with a preemptive thanks to Nick for sending us this one at scathingnews at gmail.com. Thanks. Ooh. You know, in a lot of ways, being a Roman Catholic priest is a sweet gig. The pay's pretty good. There's lots of travel. You don't have to do any actual things. You get a large selection of flamboyant uniforms, and you're immune from almost all the laws. So it seems like it should be a pretty easy position to fill. And yet, the Vatican is facing a worldwide shortage of people willing to take the job so severe that it threatens their continued existence. Well, Archbishop Charles Cacluna of Malta may have just nailed the heart of the issue. Perhaps because he wasn't allowed to nail anything else. Fucking, you see, is great. It's just really great. And forced celibacy is a <laughs> fucked up torture that literally breaks our minds. And so he's made the heretical suggestion that perhaps Catholicism should give up the celibacy requirements for priests. Yeah, okay. So you know how I don't give dancing advice from inside of a magical booth. It's kind of <laughs> like that. It's like that. Right. It's like that. Sorry. You know what they say about Skakluna of Malta? Don't. What's that? It means no worries. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Skakluna of Malta. Yeah. Skakluna of Malta. Skakluna of Malta. I was happy with that as you are. Now, yeah. <laughs> so to be clear, the <laughs> 
<laughs> that's it. That's the show this week, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm not doing any better. We will better do nothing but this now. <laughs> <laughs> now, to be clear, the, <laughs> the majority of Catholic priests have already given up on the celibacy requirements, and not just when they're raping children. The impressive volume of priests gets arrested during gay orgy stories we cover on this show should serve as plenty of evidence of that as should the fact that priests can reach their own dicks. But the celibacy policy is still in place, and Skakluna would like to change it. In an interview with the Times of Malta, he pointed out that the church had, quote, lost many great priests because they chose marriage, end quote, and said that if it were up to him, he would revise the celibacy requirement, though he admitted that many within the Vatican would view such a move as heretical. Okay, you know a bunch of priests right now are like, come on, I'm fucking 90. Yeah. Man, this is <laughs> bullshit. This doesn't help me much. I'm uh, yeah. just doing lines of Viagra still. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're willing to defy what you believe to be the divine command for clergy from the Apostle Matthew because the incoming class is a little small? Mm -hmm. This is what mm -hmm. it took? Yeah. So now, to be fair, this is not the first we've heard of taking priest dicks out of retirement during the reign of Pope Francis or wives either, right? So back in 2017, he publicly mused about the potential of ordaining married men to help out in areas that face severe priest shortages to the extent that not having enough child rapists around to lie to people can be severe, I guess. It's also come up virtually every time any organization has made a good faith effort to look into why serial rape is such a particular issue within this particular institution in the instances that those good faith efforts were allowed to publish their findings, that is. And because, fun fact, if you tell undereducated men who made their vows when they were 17 that they're somewhere between humans and angels, but that any sex will break that vow and damn them to hell forever, the thing is, they get a hell of a lot less choosy about who they're fucking when you do yep. that. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. In for a penny, in for pounding is kind of... <laughs> <mentality>. <laughs> No, it's actually hard to read the tea leaves as far as like where little orphan Franny actually comes down on this issue. Because after publicly suggesting it in 2017, he publicly disavowed it in 2019. In 2021, he specifically rejected a proposal that would have allowed a limited number of elderly married men to be ordained in a limited area with a severe priest shortage, again, whatever the fuck that means. But in 2023, he said that celibacy as a rule was, quote, not eternal like priestly ordination, end quote, and said that it could be revised in the future. So it's kind of hard to say where he is on the issue. It kind of feels like, you know, one of those like house painting companies. It's like show up in the parking lot of Home Depot at 8 a.m. and you can be a priest like for a day if we need you, I guess. Yeah. You are allowed to fuck and right. have this job, perhaps. Right. And I, I should be clear on this. Look, the celibacy rule for Catholic priests was adopted in the 11th century. It's not a foundational concept inextricably intertwined with the church's very being. It's a self-imposed torture they adopted back when we were still trying to cure migraines with powdered human skull. Almost all the other Christians let their priests fuck, and they managed to lie about salvation just as good as the Catholics do. So it's unnecessary. It contributes to depression and suicide among priests. It contributes to the rape of children and vulnerable adults. It fucks up their recruitment efforts, and it serves no fucking purpose. So given and what we know about the Catholic Church, strong bet it's here to stay. Yeah, that's right on brand. And in God don't make no Trump news, as the Republican primary swirls around the bowl of politics towards its inevitable conclusion, in spite of what seems more and more like the absolute truth of Trump's nomination, it's fair to say that the former president's self-promotion has gotten weird. From accepting the nomination of BlackLivesMatter.fun to tweeting out a picture of himself accompanied in court by Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his campaign has become a smidge self-edifying. And we took another step up the ladder to Trump at God King this week when he tweeted out a video titled, So God Made Trump. Yeah. Yeah, so before the primary is over, he'll graduate from threatening to shoot a guy on Fifth Avenue to threatening to strike that guy with lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Sword mouth that guy to death. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Definitely completely unhinged. That was insane. But I'm not sure this was a step up the ladder. Like Eli said, this might Solid have been point. his team Solid saying point. <laughs> something like, hey, Donald, you remember the giant golden idol and Nazi runes at CPAC? Those were a little much. Maybe dial it back to, I don't know, like... I am Neo and God gave me Kung Fu or something more chill. <laughs> That's fair. 
That is a fair yeah. response, Ethan, right? Okay, so first things first, a big thank you to everyone who sent us this video. If you want to do our jobs for us, knowing that it brings you one step closer to sexual Congress, you can what? send us atheist news at scathingnews at gmail.com. Now, Morgan, I want to be clear, this video is a ripoff of a ripoff of a bad speech, yes. right? The original speech given in 1978 is called So God Made a Farmer. And then earlier last year, Ron DeSantis tweeted out a self-serving video version about himself. Well, like everything else, Trump took DeSantis's thing and made it fucking crazier, giving us the video he posted on Truth Social this week. Ooh, I can't wait to see Trump's version of the boots. Oh, it's the one thing I wanted that the video didn't have. And, and look, I'm picturing it now. It's so stupid. Yes. See, it's got rhinestones all over it. Yeah, yes. They're, they're high heeled in my vision. Yeah. And look, I know what I'm about to read you. It's a little bit on the long side, but I promise you, this is comedy fucking gold. So let's go over the transcript of this video, shall we? Quote. And on June 14th, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. <sighs> so God gave us Trump. Sorry, d does it happen in that voice like that? I didn't watch it. It absolutely yes, happens it totally in this voice. voice. Yes, He's not does. exaggerating God. at all. <laughs> God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, fix this country, work all day, fight the Marxists, what? eat supper. What? Yeah, he does eat supper. To be clear, the thing that he does in that list is eat supper. Eats yes. a Big Mac. All right. Yeah. Then go to the Oval Office and stay past midnight at a meeting of the heads of state. So God made Trump. Which, okay. So first of all, he's trying to make needing to get up to pee at 5 a.m. a virtue. And then <laughs> he's lying from that also point on. Lying. He's just yeah. lying. Well, about the supper thing's real, but everything else. <laughs> also, just to be clear, he works all day and then he fights the Marxists before supper. That's that's such a small window. So first of all, lazy. <laughs> yes. Also, didn't leave enough time for Marxist fighting on the no, schedule. Yeah, that's weird. Also, we're not making our big <laughs> Marxist moves during Marxist happy hour. It doesn't even make right? sense what he's saying. Thank there. you. <laughs> also, you've just let the Marxists hang around all fucking day while you were getting all done morning. With work. You they had just brunch it off. Yeah. <laughs> to redistribute the eggs Benedict. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it continues. I need somebody with arms strong enough to rustle the deep state and yet what? gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. What? Who is what? that for? <laughs> Who is that? Like, yes. You know how my arms are right in the Goldilocks zone? Write that down. People <laughs> want that in a leader's Goldilocks arms. It continues. Somebody to ruffle the feathers. Tame, cantankerous world economic forum. Come home hungry. Have to wait until the first lady is done with lunch with friends. Then tell the <laughs> lady. Okay, that feels so weird. That's such a weird passive aggressive thing against Ivanka. Remember then though, she wasn't done when I was done with the phone. Remember, I had to wait. He's this so magical <laughs> character created by God, and he's just like tapping his foot, being like, "Oh, lunch is going pretty long there. I guess I'll wait. It's in the speech." But then he can't get into the fucking brunch room because they're. Still in there, Gabin. Anyways, fuck. Then tell the ladies to be sure and come back real soon and mean it. So God gave us Trump. Okay, I have to dial this back for just a second here. I will readily believe that Donald Trump spent a lot of time with his daughter's vag, but I don't think he delivered his grandchild. What does that, that mean? I, 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 that seems insane to me. There's no way that's. Real. I just. I need the fucking context behind that story. <laughs> I do. I do. All right. He, he continues. I need somebody who can shape an axe but wield a sword, who had the courage to step foot in North Korea, who can make money from the tar of the sand, turn liquid into gold, who understands the difference between tariffs and inflation. What? Will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon, but then put in another 72 hours. So God made Trump. Turn liquid to gold? <laughs> yeah, what the fuck was that? A hundred bucks says he's going to declare himself the sun and the moon before November 5th. I also know alchemy on top of my perfect golden rock arms right that <laughs> and nunchaku stuff. But, that, but, that but I do have to wait. But Ivanka still won't let me be in the same room as her when she's eating. So, you know, again, pluses and minuses. All right. God said, I need somebody who will be strong and courageous, who will not be afraid or terrified of the wolves when they attack, a man who cares for the flock, 
a shepherd to mankind who won't ever leave nor forsake them. I need the most diligent worker to follow the path and remain strong in faith. And know the belief of God and country. Somebody, this sentence is a fucking labyrinth. It's <laughs> somebody just, this who's is all willing. one sentence. <laughs> yeah. Somebody who's willing to drill, bring back manufacturing and American jobs, farm the lands, secure our borders, build lands? our military, fight the system all day. Fight the system. You would be the, this. That's what got you impeached the, the second time was fight <laughs> the, the fucking one. system. Yeah. Yeah. Is Biden anti farming? I've, I've heard that. I've Clearly. heard he's aren't any. I hate he never plants. Seen. I'm Joe Biden. <laughs> what? Very pro system, that president of our United States. <laughs> and it concludes and finish a hard week's work by attending church on Sunday. And then his oldest son turns and says, Dad, let's make America great again, Dad. Let's build back a country to be the envy of the world again. So God made Trump. Okay, so Trump, end of video. Trump is Jesus of Nazareth now sure, in that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So okay, well you heard him, Jack Smith. Lots of great ideas for sentencing there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff in there. Get in there. So yeah, um, a normal and chill thing for a presidential candidate to tweet out about himself. Yes, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just saying maybe play this video the next time your Republican uncle calls Joe Biden a tyrant for doing his job as president. There I'm just saying, it's, 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 murdering hey. all the plants. That's Biden's <laughs> fault. Thanks, Biden. And in come all ye faithful news tonight. We have a remarkably stupid controversy out of the Vatican to report on, and I'm just going to read the opening paragraph of the story from Religious News Services to lay it out in all its idiotic glory. Quote, the Vatican's new doctrine chief, who is already under fire from entire bishops' conferences for his approval of blessing for same-sex couples, is now raising eyebrows over a book he wrote as a young priest describing orgasms in graphic detail. End quote. Really? Yes, the guy whose job is, among other things, to decide the Catholic position on the humanhood of gay people is in trouble for knowing how coming works. Wow. Knowing about butt stuff comes back to bite you in the ass. You hate to see it. <laughs> Only in Catholicism. Now I'm picturing someone stretching out Heath's ass like they're a cartoon tying a balloon with their teeth and uh, him planning to podcast about it. That's Band what I'm picturing. Yeah, there you go. I'm wearing the boots in my head now. So I was already picturing <laughs> that, but yeah. This is uh, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, and he's the boogeyman under the bed of Catholic conservatives the world over right now. So you can see why they're worried about him knowing so much about orgasms, I guess. He's Pope Francistern's theological ghostwriter, and he was given the job of the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith, whatever okay. the fuck that means, with orders to shake things up a bit. He's the one behind the embarrassingly small bones the Vatican has been throwing towards LGBTQ people over the past year. Well, because of those concessions, conservatives have been furiously digging dirt up on this guy. And that's how they found this long out of print book, which is called The Mystical Passion, Spirituality <laughs> and Sensuality. I don't think that's how they found it. Somebody was like, why do I have this book of erotica written by a priest? Well, why am I holding it sideways? It's for opposition... <laughs> Uh, it's research, oppo research, science, um, <laughs> flip, <laughs> fold job. out, center fold research. So, for our younger listeners, the pornography was sometimes <laughs> you sideways. You had to turn the. Sometimes it was on paper. It's it's a whole thing. Yeah. You'd find it in the woods. So you would. So Fernandez says he wrote the book for young couples who wanted to better understand their relationships. But his critics point out that as a celibate priest, he shouldn't know so damn much about orgasms. He even describes female orgasms in the book, which even most non-celibate <laughs> Catholic men don't know about. Okay, that book's part of the Apocrypha now, officially. Yeah, right there with uh, <laughs> Thomas. And, and by the way, this isn't the only book he's under fire over. There was a controversy shortly after his appointment over a book he wrote on the art of kissing called, I swear I'm not making this up, Heal Me With Your Mouth. Come on. Okay. A, gross. <laughs> B, a book he wrote with no regards to the cooties he was exposing his flock to. The right. madness <laughs> must stop. Circle, circle, dot, dot. Yes. <laughs> Oh, God, I wish I knew that in Latin. Oh, if only I knew circle, circle, <laughs> dot, dot, in Latin. Oh, no, right I took Latin. God, damn I can it. do this. Come on. You you guys podcast. I got this. Okay, all You're right. You're thinking circum, circum, dot, em, dot. Em. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's what I'm working on right now. <laughs> you may ask yourself, how could I possibly give a fuck? And that's a great question. 
To be honest, I only bring it up because the very idea of the child rape cabal's watchdogs freaking out because one of their guys wrote a book on consensual sex is like if this show's overall point collapsed into a fucking singularity. <laughs> uh, and also, I wanted to soften Heath and Eli up for the day that I inevitably asked them to do a group reading of Heal Me With Your Mouth, The Art. Yes, next book. Oh, can we just dig up and kiss C.S. Lewis's corpse and sort of have it done as one? <laughs> it sounds so much more pleasant than what we have planned. <laughs> also, it's circulus, circulus, punctum, punctum, according to ChatGPT. Oh, that's perfect. And it's, that's very Love disappointing. It. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I'm going to get Anna to write a song and it's a <laughs> circulus, circulus, <laughs> punctum. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bored Italians singing along to it at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in bandwidth edging news, if you look at the history of religion in the world, if you really dig, you might be able to find some, you know, bad logic or silly tradition or centuries of coordinated bigotry and oppression and war and sexual abuse and standing in the way of human progress in general. And without a group of intrepid reporters on a podcast, it's easy to miss that stuff because you didn't really dig or you might just ignore it. But now, religion is fucking with your porn. Uh oh. Thanks to religious lunatics in several state governments across the country, there's a long, obnoxious, privacy-violating process required to access adult content sites. And when those laws in Montana and North Carolina kicked in last week, Pornhub decided to just shut it all down and block those locations. If this doesn't make you atheist, I don't know what will. Okay, at least one of our listeners just had to deal with the fact that fucking with their porn made them an activist when raping kids and torturing gay people didn't. And I feel like that person needs a minute. <laughs> yeah, hey, that person, as someone whose intro to atheism was a Carl Sagan animation on E. Baum's world, I feel you and you're safe here, okay? <laughs> you're safe with one of the hosts of this podcast. <laughs> and a big thanks to Jacqueline and Carrie for the links, scathingnewsgmail.com if you want to help out. So the problem stems from a growing movement among several state governments to ramp up age verification measures that gatekeep adult content. In places like Mississippi, Arkansas, and Utah, where, honestly, pleasure is already a very scarce commodity that often has to be imported from exotic locales in the outside secular <laughs> world, users face additional checkpoints tied to government IDs to verify they're over 18. Some platforms even require facial recognition via webcam to access their content. And unless you're into that sort of thing the privacy invasion kind of fucks up the mood. Lots of people are still going to do it, but, you know, the vibes are weird at that point. And really, it's all about the vibes, right? Yeah, right. No, like, hey, I came here to violate myself, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I just want to be clear because I know there are secular people who approve of these safety measures. The objection isn't to stopping children from watching porn, but... If you think the states that are enacting these laws aren't exactly the states that are going to start handing out gay and trans porn speeding tickets, you have not looked up this very slippery slope we've been sliding down for the last few yeah. decades, friend. No. Come on, join me here at the bottom. It's sticky. <sighs> yeah. So with hefty fines and litigation dangling over the heads of content providers, one major player called ALO decided it's not worth the hassle and cut off access to two states. ALO is the parent company behind Pornhub, Brazzers, RedTube, and uh, a bunch of other uh, advanced level sites that I'm going to call aspirational. <laughs> and they've completely blocked access to IP addresses in Montana and North Carolina. Instead of porn, partially fluffed visitors are greeted with a bucket of cold water in the form of actress Sherry DeVille in disappointingly appropriate garb, explaining that ID checks are an invasion of privacy and do nothing to protect the children, which is true. On top of the privacy issue and the risk of identity theft, this sort of policy ends up driving traffic to more dangerous places, like actual danger, not just the woods to find a playboy or like right. seeing boobies as a danger. That's so impressive because like not many industries can pull off the like, we'll just not let you give us money then power move. Right. They, and they can't. It's, it's basically it's porn providers, doctors and gas companies in the winter that have this economic privilege. Right. And Marsh's house. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so in response to the new ID laws, Pornhub released a statement explaining that we already have a device based system. If 
Religious parents want to censor the content for their kids and destroy the concept of joy entirely. So the ID checks are all downside is their point. And the invisible hand job of the market is already responding to searches for VPN in Montana and North Carolina have skyrocketed, presumably rivaling either state's most popular search terms on Pornhub. Those terms are BDSM and bubble butt, in case you were wondering. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing where I didn't realize I was wondering it until you told me what it was. And I was. <laughs> yeah, gentlemen, join me over here for a sidebar. Can we agree that bubble butt is a weird thing to search for when you want to see juicy asses? Like, don't get me wrong. We stand a pack in behind. But it's like if you were into monster cocks and you called them gummy peepees. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't like the term. term <laughs> the term it. bothers me. Okay. Fair. All right. Noted. Ill to die <laughs> Eli Bostic. Tim, cut that out for the quote this week. Do it in the black and white. Majestic one. <laughs> all right. And just a quick note for all the Christian right lawmakers doing this sort of thing. We know you're listening. If your adolescent years happened in the 90s, probably true for a bunch of you, a whole bunch of your sexual development is based on the very slow edging process created by pornographic content getting delivered a few pixels at a time using 50 <laughs> free hours of dial-up from a CD. And yes, that can be delightful. Believe me, believe me, I get it. But during that slow roll, we, we can't be doing extra tasks of manual dexterity like handling government ID cards, getting them out of our wallet, filling out forms. It's untenable. Yeah. Right? If only getting fucked by your government came with a guarantee of completion. Alas. Yeah. <laughs> and in WrestleMania news tonight. As sacrosanct as we hold our First Amendment rights to be in this country, we do recognize that there are certain extenuating circumstances that might reasonably call for them to be temporarily abrogated. Perhaps we face a deadly pandemic, in which case the right to freely assemble might be impinged for the sake of communal health. Perhaps we find ourselves in times of war, in which case the right of a free press might be curtailed for the sake of national security. Or perhaps... As was the case at the Southside High School and Rainbow Middle School in Etowah County, Alabama, you're feeling a little bit snacky, in which case the rights of <laughs> students not to be directly proselytized to at school might be suspended for the sake of otherwise rumbly tummies, which was clearly the reasoning behind an offer those schools wrestling coaches sent out to local churches, giving them a chance to preach to the wrestling team in exchange for a few boxes of munchies. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to drive up to the school in a marked van. It'll be totally <laughs> cool and normal. <laughs> okay, sorry. I feel like I'm the pushback guy this week, but I mean, what kind of snacks are we talking about okay, here? There, so are, there is a price we'll, is what we'll I'm saying. We'll get there. We'll get there. So, yeah. has been in so many vans marked and otherwise. <laughs> I've been in so <laughs> many. Unmolestable is uh, my profile on <laughs> molester.com. Okay. So, yeah, so this real thing that actually happened came in the form of a letter that read in part, quote, we know our churches play a vital role in this community. We are looking for some area churches to connect with our South Side wrestling team in a very tangible way. During our wrestling season, we supply our wrestlers with water and granola bars. OK, granola bars. Sorry, I am out. Figured you would be. We are asking, continues, we are asking local churches to consider donating six cases of water and four packs of 24 granola bars to help our team. The letter then goes on to explain that they're willing to take more if you have more and that in a pinch trail mix or uncrustables will also do the trick. Uh, but then it gets illegal. <laughs> Eli's back in. Yeah, right. <laughs> Quote, <laughs> We would like to give those churches who are able to donate a chance to speak into the lives of the students on our team by sharing a short 15 minute devotional. And then in case anybody thought they were only committing the one crime, they add, quote, we are very excited about this opportunity again this year. Again, we really enjoyed it last year. <laughs> End quote. Greatly enjoyed the robbery I did. Thank you for continuing the ongoing bribe crime that we do. Yours in Christ co-conspirated. It's like they're doing a sting operation on themselves yes. and catching yeah. themselves. Right. He's like, what, why am I dictating this letter into a wire that I'm wearing? This is so weird. Yeah. So I said all that, too. I got to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of important takeaways here. First of all, we finally have a direct exchange rate between granola bars and minutes of unconstitutional proselytization. Good to know. It is 6.4 granola bars per minute, but that that's to, quote, close to 50 wrestlers, end quote. 
So we'll call it 45. That works out to one granola bar per 7.03125 kid minutes. But secondly, <laughs> and perhaps even more importantly, you'll notice that this letter clearly says churches and not a more collective term like religious institutions or houses of worship. Because get this, turns out they weren't offering this same opportunity to nearby synagogues, mosques, satanic temples, or atheist groups. No way. Which is so weird because we have so many granola bars. We do. <laughs> I, I, granola bars, I'm willing to go, listen to me, I'm willing to go full Chipotle catering for 15 minutes on why monogamy is sexual slavery for these wrestling <laughs> middle schoolers, okay? Now, obviously... They've been told to fucking stop it. The FFRF sent them a fucking stop it letter in which they pointed out that, quote, by explicitly inviting churches to proselytize to students, the district displays clear favoritism for religion over non-religion and Christianity above other faiths, end quote. But as obviously true a statement as that is, right wing media in Alabama had no trouble finding state lawmakers willing to defend the blatantly unconstitutional offer. You don't say. Yeah, right. Huh. Republican State Senator Greg Reed told a local right wing outlet that our focus should be on praising Jesus and that that focus should, quote, not be interrupted by out of state groups trying to push faith out of our lives and the lives of our children, end quote. Uh, and by pushing, of course, he means standing still in defiance of their shove. Yeah, exactly. These out of state Jews are trying to not push into our pushing their. When will it end? Right, is what yeah. I ask the pushing. Yeah. I feel like they wouldn't be cool about in-state Jews in Alabama. I feel like well, that's right. yeah, no, yes. not what they're doing. That's on their flag, actually. Yeah. You gotta watch for it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine how offering the profession most heavily associated with child molestation unhindered access to a group of junior high age wrestlers for a set price could go wrong. But even if it goes right, super duper illegal Christian nationalist bullshit, regardless of fucking which state the FFRF is headquartered in. But if that's how we're doing things, that's how we're doing things. I'm five hours away from Etowah and I have access to a fuck ton of Uncrustables. <laughs> you never told me you had Uncrustables, Noah. Well, it's because I was saving them in case I needed them for a situation like this, Eli. Okay, well... I, re, objection removed. <laughs> Eli carries like a bandolier of those things through the airport whenever he travels. I do. It's true. I buy t I buy so many that they do that like tilt behind you to see like a hungry bus of children. I'm like, nope, just me. Just <laughs> keep beeping them, please. Or go in the back push your button. and open up the new container. Yeah, go I get the new box. I don't go see. This isn't hard. Hudson News. And in UFO, no, you didn't news. A lot of things from the 1970s are having a renaissance in the last couple of years. Bell bottoms. Don't say it like that. Racism. <laughs> I left because I, I, my spite desire to say renaissance again <laughs> took over the word racism. <laughs> I was like, racism. Rena renaissance. <laughs> Bell bottoms. Don't say charade. Racism. <laughs> and of course, alien invasion charades. God yes. damn it. After a year where Congress held official hearings on what Mitch's buddy done told me, it was inevitable for the stupid panic to yield yet another stupid panic. And last week, we got another example as a clip of what was alleged to be a 10-foot alien <laughs> invading a Miami <laughs> mall went viral on Twitter. Y'all, the aliens aren't doing recon in a place that's going to be part of the ocean in like a year. Just think it through. That doesn't even make sense. It, right? Plus, if you wanted the aliens to think Earthlings aren't worth coming back for, let them start in Florida. Man. Jesus, that's right, where we exactly. want them. That's perfect. It's useful. Now, the clip, which I honestly had to watch like half a dozen times just to understand what it's supposed to be, has garnered just over 6.9 million views at this point. And it allegedly shows a large, smoky, alien figure plodding its way along the wall of the mall. But <laughs> it's just it? very clearly three dudes walking in a line. Like, <laughs> when I checked this morning, Twitter had added a hey, this is just three dudes walking together <laughs> thing to the bottom of the clip, along with a video from the different angle. But that didn't stop conspiracy theorists nutbags from accusing all involved of a cover-up. Right, including the Miami Police Department. Now, in fairness, the Miami Police Department 
they'd get a call from a literal 10 foot alien about like a Cuban family having a barbecue and they'd show up and be taking the <laughs> aliens official complaint very seriously, <laughs> being super nice about it. But so, but this video is a great thing to have around, right? Because whenever you're asking yourself like how Trump happened or how whatever terrible, stupid fucking political thing happened. You just look at this video. You remind yourself that millions of Americans saw this and thought it was an alien. <laughs> and then you, you, you just remember not to have hope anymore in the first place. And you just give in. Right. Exactly. Light up that ball. So you're probably wondering, though, because if you've seen this clip, you're probably wondering what did happen. Well, something far more fittingly Floridian than a close encounter of the <laughs> Disney kind. It was a giant brawl with the cops where someone threw fireworks. Yes. Oh, Florida. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Those fireworks were mistaken for gunshots because this is America, which is why there are so many cop cars and why the scene was generally filled with panic. Four people have been arrested since the incident. And since a little boy hasn't smuggled any of them to freedom in his bike basket, we can assume the culprits are all human. But human? I, I don't think Floridians deserve a presumption of humanity here, but OK. All right. <laughs> All right. Whatever you say. Regardless of the reality of the situation, it's nice to know that even in the age of instant news, cameras on every phone and information that can be fact checked at the speed of being there, bullshit can still spread. Do you smell that, gentlemen? Because it smells like job security. <laughs> uh, well, I guess we uh, need a minute to soak in that terrifying assurance. So we should probably close the headlines there. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll finally learn what the CS stands for. Oh, um... <clears throat> hey, Heath, what's the matter? Yeah, you seem blue. I don't know. A case of the Januaries, I guess. The holidays are over, and the weather is so gloomy now. I guess I just don't feel like I have something to look forward to, you know? Well, have you thought about buying a ticket to see God Awful Movies live in Orlando, Florida on March 2nd? God Awful Movies live in Orlando March 2nd? What's that? It's our podcast, but live and on stage with all the visible shenanigans you never knew you were missing. Plus, we'll be reviewing an anti-Disney documentary made by the Catholic League. Does it have Bill Donahue? You bet your ass it has Bill Donahue. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm sold. Where do I get my tickets? Godawfulmovieslive.com Godawfulmovieslive.com? Godawfulmovieslive.com God Awful Movies Live on March 2nd in Orlando, Florida. If you miss it, Bill Donahue wins. From the earliest days of this podcast, one of the roles that we've tried to fill for our listeners is that of masochistic bibliophile. This started when we committed to read the Bible together on episode nine, but though I'd have doubted as much if you told me at the time, that eventually came to an end. And then we had a monthly say <laughs> segment to fill, so we went on to read the Quran, the Book of Mormon, Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, and most recently, <sighs> David Icke's Everything You Need to Know But Have Never Been Told. Okay, we needed to be told, don't read this book in the title. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I guess David Icke was assuming somebody would have told us that, which is a fair assumption, but still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, now I feel like we just underestimated how committed he was to the word everything. You right. know, I, yeah. I really <laughs> I didn't take that seriously enough. Well, it's time to set out once again on that path of literary self harm. Now, we've received a number of suggestions as to which book to do next Dianetics, the Urantia book, the Bhagavad Gita, but those books are all really long and fuck you. Why would you even try <laughs> to put us through that? So, what we're going to do, we're going to go a little easier on ourselves than that with C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So in preparation for this, I went ahead and purchased myself a physical copy of the book. I could only find it coupled with shrew trape letters in a single volume. So I have that now, too. And I figure I could use cool. that as a threat uh, to Eli <laughs> in case he goes too far off topic at any point. All right. I got my copy from an Anglican church in Australia from their website. They seem like really big fans of this work. Also, I got it from something called Course Hero because uh, I tried to go to SparkNotes and SparkNotes was like, no, gross. No, what? No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. And I stole mine online because I'll be damned if I'm going to lose my god-awful movies piracy streak to the guy who wrote Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay, all right. 
Uh, I should say, I also went ahead and bought a beer Christianity study guide, which to much to my disappointment, didn't have quizzes or essay questions or, or anything that I could give to you guys, but I'm sure I'll, I'll find some use for it. Yeah. How many ply is it? I That's have, a great I question, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I don't care what the answer is. Cool. So, <laughs> so for those unfamiliar, Mere Christianity is the most famous work of Christian apologetics by Clive Staples Lewis or C.S. Lewis. <laughs> C.S. Lewis is a good choice, it's buddy. Not, it's not Q.S. Suis Lewis. <laughs> yep, like nope. Jolkin, Rokin, Rokin, Tolkien. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's disappointing. <laughs> So yeah, so C.S. Lewis, of course, he's better known as the author of The Chronicles of Narnia. And apparently the book was an expansion on a series of radio Q&As that he gave during World War II. Because I guess God had an awful lot to answer for in that particular moment. Yeah. Imagine your home being under constant threat of fiery explosion. And every time a bell drags you out of sleep or work or school to the relative safety of a shelter while you fear for your life, the guy in charge of ringing that bell is like, so I guess I know that stealing is bad is probably why Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Yes, yeah. think about <laughs> right. the fact It was that like that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're not going to get into any of the actual arguments this week. We're just going to deal with the front matter, which begins with the preface. He starts off by talking about the chain of custody of this knowledge and how the book came to be. It started off as the radio talks, like we said, and then it was published in three different little tiny books. And now it's one big book. And it's funny because like what he's saying is, look, I've milked this same material twice already, and now I'm selling it to you again. <laughs> but he does so with the expectation of a thank you. And he's like, and you're welcome. You might as well have auto ads mid-sentence in the text of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not if he doesn't want to be sued by Daddy Issues LLC. He doesn't. I'll yeah, tell you like, that right now. Oh, he, he points out that since this was written to be said on radio, it's not as literary as it otherwise could be. I'm actually way more literary than my literature suggests. See, right, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I would join in on the fun, but I'm pretty sure I used this exact same disclaimer at the beginning of Diatribes Volume 1. So Yeah, I wrote in my notes, <laughs> this is like Noah's Diatribes disclaimer, but without the talent or the things to talk about. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I think. He explains how it was written with a conversational tone. And then he says, quote, I am now inclined to think that was a mistake, an undesirable hybrid between the art of speaking and the art of writing, end quote. So not instilling us with a ton of confidence right out of the gate. He says almost exact words. This was originally a radio segment and I spoke like a human because nobody wants to hear you just read an essay. But then he's like, don't worry. Now it's double translated back into writing like. Somebody reading you a VCR manual on the radio as a text <laughs> about religion. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. God, oh, this sucks. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why I began so many of these with was up. It was, <laughs> it was popular at the time. No, there's, there's a very, like, if you think this book is bad now, you should have seen how bad it was before I took out the contractions vibe to this. Yes, yeah, you know? he tries to sell the new version by saying he expanded out the spoken contractions. So the new version has the full did not Ooh. instead of didn't. And he got rid of the spoken italics and made literary italics instead. So, all right, sorry. Sprocken italics versus <laughs> Literary italics. They, it must have sounded insane before I clarified what I meant by that. But <laughs> yeah, he fixed yeah. that and he makes a big deal about it right here. Somewhere between it sure would upset grandma if Jesus wasn't real and I feel it in my heart and you're mean if I say I don't. I realized that I was embarrassing myself with all these apostrophes. So <laughs> it's all good now, everybody. So. Yeah, but then he's like, also, I'm not going to step into any of that Catholic v. Protestant bullshit. That's y'all shit, right? He says he's going to stick to beliefs common to all Christians at all times. Really? <laughs> so nothing? This book's yeah. going to be nothing? <laughs> yeah. And he says, the differences between the different types of Christianity are a matter of ecclesiastical history, which is only for the experts. So I'm going to stick to the magical thinking field in which I am an expert. Yeah. That's almost exactly what he says. Translation, I'm a fiction writer. Here's my expert book on epistemology. That's what we're about to read. <laughs> right. And he puts it like he's being all humble, right? Oh, a simple farmer like me don't want to meddle in the highfalutin world of theology, so I'll just be sticking to the eternal truth of the universe, yes, which right. I know. Thank yes. you. Yep. Oh, God. He even says he's like straight up, he's like, 
you know, talking about all this interdenominational shit is going to scare away the atheists. Yeah, no, CS, good read. As your neighbors huddled around praying that their children would survive another bombing, it was the disagreement on the Eucharist that was rattling <laughs> yeah. their faith. Yeah, so I'm glad right. you could see that. <laughs> wow, this, this whole Nazi thing is rough. This is bad. Do you guys think Santa Claus should have punched that guy in the face at the Council of Nicaea? Because I think that's, that matters to your praying, right? <laughs> so, yeah, but he assures us that just because he doesn't mention it in the book, he does know that everybody but Episcopalians are going to go to hell. Yes. Right. He's like an Italian mom trying to keep peace at Christmas. We're going to sit down and have a nice apologetics book and we're not going <laughs> to talk about your sister's abortion. Okay? A nice family <laughs> apologetics book. That's all I want. I'm dating a person of color. <laughs> oh. He's right here. He's like, do you want to freak out the Catholics? Because talking about the Virgin Mary, that's how you freak out the Catholics. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I cannot emphasize enough that this is the actual order of his statements. I don't want to get into anything controversial, but some people say Catholics are idol worshiping olive suckers. <laughs> I'm done with this part of the book. Let's, I am. Yes. Let's keep yes. it non controversial. God impregnated a child with photon cum. That is common ground we can all agree on. Yes. Let's just leave it at that. We're not scientists here. Right. We'll just leave it at the photon cum. Well, he says he even says he had his work checked by representatives of all the Christianities, and he lists them: Anglican, Methodist, <laughs> Presbyterian, and Roman Catholic. Also, I have a Jewish friend. I don't know yeah, why I said that. But I mean, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. And by the way, he says he's like and even in that list, I alphabetized him. I didn't rank him in order, even though like he's Anglican and he used Roman Catholic instead of Catholic, so that they wouldn't be second. <laughs> <laughs> but his overall point seems to be, but mostly we're united which is severely undercut by him feeling the need to proceed it with several pages about why he's not talking about all the shit they aren't united on. Yeah, this entire section is him describing how Catholics and Protestants do like war crimes about the recipe for crackers. And then he's like, yeah, so anyway, I wrote a book about why all the other religions are wrong, but we're yes. all together on our right. Jesus thing. Well, then he, then he explains why he doesn't talk about all the types of sin in the parts of where he talks about morals. Right. He's like, well, you know, I don't talk about birth control because I'm not a lady. And I'm like, oh, I'm 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 here for this. He says, or a married man. And I'm like, oh, well, now you got to you should probably shut up. Yeah. Yeah. In my version, the list of people he does think should be in the birth control discussion includes pastors. So he's not all the way in shut the fuck up, Phil, which is where I want him to be. Yeah. 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 If you do all the sins, you're going to look pretty stupid because that's a lot of dumb stuff. He's just like, yeah, so there's. <laughs> I mean, there's a part in the book about the sin of polyester. There's three separate mentions about not boiling babies in their mother's breast milk. <laughs> ah, gonna look like an idiot if I don't skip a bunch of this book, just so yeah. everybody knows. I'm gonna cherry pick the shit out of this right now. <laughs> then he deals with the all important who the fuck are you to decide who is and isn't a real Christian question. And he doesn't deal with it well. No, right. It, look, it's a solid objection at this point, right? Because he's like, I'm here to do some bullshit apologetics about who is and isn't a Scotsman. And people are like, okay, cool. Can we be vague too? And he's like, no, only me. I'll be muddling the <laughs> definition of words around here. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's a, he compares the use of uh, the term Christian to the use of the word gentleman. His, his point seems to be that he's not using Christian as a value judgment, just as a means of excluding foreign people. Yeah, yeah. Christian doesn't mean good or bad. Its dictionary definition is people who agree with C.S. <laughs> Lewis. Right. Also, I'm saying they're good with international banking and controlling the media. I mean, that's positive. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, they're right. good at that. <laughs> tunnels. There's also a fun moment where he's like, look, if by Christian we mean person who lives up to our stated principles of Christianity, <laughs> yeah. none of us are ever going to get in. We Come can't on. Can't do We're that. all liars. Look, look, we all farted in the elevator. I think that guy right there took a full shit here in this elevator. <laughs> Everybody just be cool and don't let Lil Nas X into the building. That's what we all agree <laughs> on, right? Yeah, right? You guys right. want a bird box? This is how we get bird box. <laughs> He also points out that he's not trying to start his own form of Christianity, which is apparently the kind of warning you have to give people in the schism fest that is Christianity. He assures us that God probably has a good reason for splitting true believers into a bunch of contradictory, mutually exclusive, murderous groups, but he just doesn't know what it is. So Mysterious ways. Right. And that's the end of the, the preface. Then in my edition, at least, we, get, uh, we switch to the voice of Kathleen Norris for a short foreword. Her starting point is how brave it was for C.S. Lewis 
to talk about Jesus on the radio during <laughs> World War II. Of all the things anybody was doing during World War II, yeah. probably the bravest of all of them. Sure, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. Apparently, he was giving sermons to the Royal Air Force starting in 1942. So here's the thing. If I got shot down by Nazis and like broke my legs and some guy who wrote a book about centaurs was telling me that God has a plan, <laughs> I, I would have left both crutches inside that guy and crawled away from that meeting. That <laughs> but that's not the bravery that Kathleen Norris was talking no. about. No, uh-uh, no. It's weird, though, that as recently as 1942, England would just be like, Hey, come on the radio and talk about how, like, that one religion that we all are to everybody. <laughs> right. I mean, to be fair, since Henry VIII got, he had to like step out and be like, "Hey, guys, God is fake. I want to marry a lady." Yeah, so right. they haven't really been able to admit the atheism thing to themselves since they had the first QED. So yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so, but she points out the contrast of a radio that's bringing you war news one day and Christian propaganda the next day. And I'm like, yeah, that second one is offensive. <laughs> she says his imagery is still relevant today. And I checked. This board was not written in 1422. So I feel like, no. <laughs> hey, CS, QS, Suis, whatever your name is. The white witch is Christianity. Hate to that's break it to you. Christian you yeah. did it backwards. Oh. Right. She, she accidentally says that he used as much imagination in this book as he did in Chronicles of Narnia. And I agree. I mean that as an insult to both books in a way that she doesn't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. In Chronicles of Narnia, he lied to us about how good Turkish delight is. Right. And in this one, he lies about how cool <laughs> God is. They're equally harmful lies. I've never gotten over that. Uh -huh. Old people talking nostalgically about old timey candy is a fucking nightmare every right. single yeah. time. Yeah. It's like Tom describing his childhood. It's so rough. <laughs> and then we'd chew on a stick of anise and it, it would poke it would <laughs> into your cheek a lot, but it had a, a good deal of flavor. I'm like licorice without the sweet. Can you hear yeah. you? Can you hear you when you say this? <laughs> So, and oh, by the way, this is where we get our first he was a former atheist claim. Page 19 of my book uh, is where that shows up. Mm. She also, she says C.S. Lewis wrote this book because Christianity needed to be dusted off and made relevant for the next generation. And I'm like, how could, how could that ever be necessary if it was really the fundamental truth about human salvation? Yeah. Okay. At the most generous, what you're saying is that children's book author C.S. Lewis is capable of something that the word of God is not. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, that he gets us ad campaign is the C.S. Lewis of today. That's so sad. Oh, God. For yeah. everybody involved. Yes, and not involved. It's just sad. Look, he's and a also, refugee yeah. skateboarder. Yeah. Squinting in and out. Jesus, <laughs> fuck you. Skip flip. You want to read a book that's basically that now? Great. Yeah, right. Yeah, she closes her forward by reminding us that all of our suffering was part of God's plan, so should, we should actually probably thank him for it if we think about it. Yeah, she's read past the second Narnia book as well. I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that gets us through to chapter one, and we're going to leave it there for the moment. But this segment will be back next month with even more of Mere Christianity. Before we tighten the lug nuts on this episode, I want to remind you that if you ever want to share a, just a diatribe or just a twim or some other segment of the show with somebody, we have most of the segments available on our YouTube channel. They usually go up within a couple of days of the episode releasing. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't with that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday and an even new episode of our half sister show's citation needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't call myself the host until I thank Heath Enright for shooting the breeze, Eli Bosnick for shooting the shit, and Lucy and illusions for shooting the bullets. I also want to thank Rich for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. That's Rich Rawl, R-A-W-L on Instagram. If you want to see his Bender cosplay, of which he is very proud. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds, Stubby Mike, Christopher, Tanya, Joseph, and Christian. Stubby Mike and Christopher are so bright LED lights complain about them, and Tanya, Joseph, and Christian are so hot they wear fire armor to protect the lava. Together, these six securely succulent secularists succeeded in succumbing to our sacrilegious sucker this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the supreme sense of self-worth it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby 
Radio and early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingads.com. And if you'd like to help, but you're devoting all your money to buying back the family farm, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Rapperson handles that for us. Additional writing for this episode was provided by Mike Schuster and Andrea Romano. And our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death rich, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. The celibacy requirements and not just, sorry. Include a Malta, baby. I've peaked. I fucking did it. We made it. I don't think I've made Noah laugh this hard in years. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's the the equivalent, the podcasting equivalent of an applause break, Eli. Yep. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.